Hey guys, what's up? I'm Aru. with the science team. So this is part two of I don't know how many of every planets in Honkai Star Rail Explained series. If you haven't watched part one where we go over a few planets already, there's Panakani, one of Shipei's planets, Skrulum's planets, the Warforge, which is Nanook's forge planet, Clepot's planet, and Salsoto, the planet where we found Well, If you're interested in those planets and their lore, I highly recommend watching that and get some context on how this series is. But if not, you can just watch this fine and dandy since we'll be going over a different set of planets, namely the ones in the timestamps below. And we're starting with the Shanzo ship. Just a few of them and an overview of its history and how they're doing today. This is how the series is basically going to be so as to keep anyone new from being way too overloaded with info. Timestamps below, let's get started. The Shanzo Lofo is just one ship in a conglomerate of other fleet ships called the Shanzo Alliance. The Alliance was initially created by an unknown sovereign with the goal of finding the Elixir of Immortality. This was all because a certain race called Wing Weavers met with quite a bit of the Shanzo clans. Wing Weavers come from the planet of Muldrasil, a huge planet-sized tree that draws all its energy from other stars. Quite a parasite of a tree if you ask me, but we'll go over Muldrasil in a different video. Back to the Shanzo fleet, once they found the Aeon of Abundance, Yaoshi, they were bestowed the blessing of immortality. But with immortality comes the rise of problems. Because they were immortal, they needed to then feed every increasing number of immortal mouths that ever existed. And because of their immortality, the more they age, the more they lose their sanity, slowly becoming the Marastruck or the Deathless Doom that we fight today. Skipping quite a lot of the events, Shanzo went from chasing immortality to pursuing the Plague's author, Yaoshi. Somewhere along this journey, the Aeon of the Hunt was born at the precipice of the Shanzo Alliance. Now, whether or not Lan became an Aeon because of Shanzo's hunt for abundance, we can't say, but Lan led a campaign war against the many denizens of abundance, which is the people of Yaoshi, through the so-called Rainbow Trail. And within those battles, some of the ships from the fleet were lost. Spearheaded by both Lan and the Arbiter Generals, this long hunt which started from pursuit of immortality to hatred and anger from a race that was both blessed and cursed then became the very philosophy that every fleet ship follows. Every Shanzo ship stands by the fundamental principles that were created and carefully honed from their quite eventful past. And proof of that hunt for the abundance are the cores of the created abominations on their ships. What was once a gift of the abundance, they now call a plague mark, and is now shackled in a prison for the advancement of the Sunfleet, which is another name for the Shanzo Alliance. Quite an ironic and messed up situation the Shanzo is in if you ask me. An immortal race pursuing the very god that they themselves ask blessings from. If anything, what they're doing now is atoning for the grave and virtually irreversible mistake that they made and the fate that they put themselves in. Imagine what would happen to every blessed world including the people of Shanzo if the Aeon that blessed them finally fell. Then again, we still have Bailu and the Vidyadara still living. There's also the possibility that Long the Permanence is still alive because of the recent 1.2 trailer. Back to the Shanzo fleet, every ship has a form of blessing from Yaoshi. The people of the Shanzo called these plague marks. The Shanzo has the Ambrosial Arbor, which is this huge tree that caught on fire. And the Yao Cheng has a moon as their plague mark. The other ships we don't know yet, but we do know their Arbiter Generals. Disclaimer, I'm not good with the names, okay? You've got the Seer Strategist, Yo Guang, and their fleet, Yu Chui, Xuan Xuan, the Sage Queller, and the Fang. Hu fleet, the Zhu Ling fleet, and their mysterious general Yo Wu, the Patina Justice, Pei Xiao, the Murden Claw from the Yao Qing, Hua Yan, the Flaming Heart and the Zhu Ming fleet, Jing Yuan, the Divine Foresight and the Lo Fu, and finally the Marshal, who I think is Lan, spearheading the fleet's advance on their indefinite mission to cleanse the universe and purify every world of the plague's authors quote-unquote blessing. There you go, the Shanzo fleet. Way too much info, but I wanted to focus on a short history, what their philosophy is, what they are doing at the moment, and the Arbiter Generals. For this next planet, one word. Borderlands. 
Or is that two words? I don't know. Planet Talia is described as a starry junkyard. All of the remnants of warships and destroyed metal pieces from the so-called planet-destroying wars of the past are what you can find in Talia today. The mountains upon mountains of junk in space ended up crashing into Talia. Along with the metal and junk, it also brought destroyed reactor cores and blasted engines. So Talia, with its junk-filled landscape, now had with it unlivable levels of radiation. Now you might be wondering, because of the radiation and junk, did Talia ever have any form of life to begin with? Well, there was no human race, but we do know that it has a rodent race. Whether or not this rodent race was humanoid or not, or if it came from the radiation that dropped into Talia, we can't say. But the rodent race is responsible for the multitude of caverns in Talia, before or after the junk ended up there. So you could kind of picture what Talia would look like. Caverns, lots of junk, lots of radiation, there's also sandstorms by the way. It's literally Borderlands, but it's anime. Nice. As to who discovered Talia and made it into a junk planet of thieves, we have the interstellar thieves to thank for that. These interstellar thieves at the time were hiding from the galaxy rangers, who were you could say witch hunters so hell bent on hunting down criminals that they were blessed by Lan the Hunt. The interstellar thieves who had neither Aeon nor power to lean on started hiding in the caverns created by the rodent race of Talia. After escaping the Galaxy Rangers, they thought to themselves, why don't we start making a little haven for all the thieving we do? And Talia was the perfect, kinda, place to make into a hideout. So as more and more thieves and bandits came to Talia, they soon made it into what was now known as the Kingdom of Banditry. And building a pretty janky and junky nation of equity and fairness. And the name speaks for itself, actually. Night raids, scrap cars, junk towns, thievery, gang wars. There's really no way to describe it other than Mad Max or Borderlands. Maybe a bit of Fallout, too. Something about this planet is that every item in Talia is a repurposed form of something else. A space engine made into a rocket launcher. A rocket launcher made into a gun. A gun made into a blowtorch. Or a blowtorch made into a breathing mask. Anything into anything as long as it works. And it's not stupid if it works. The only technological prestige that Talia has is their Wastelanders Terminal and Power Armor. The Wastelanders Terminal is a form of sensory apparatus that can map an area around you, which I think is pretty useful for the sandstorms and the radiation in that planet, as well as the raiding of other camps. The Power Armor, although quite a bit fancy looking, which it didn't need to, it has these boots that can let you take off like a rocket. I can imagine a mix of Fallout or Warhammer series type of power armor. Everything in this planet is repurposed and there is not a single item that is completely original and is still a mint condition item. Planet Talia, everyone. Moving on to the Terrarium planet, Planet Von Wack. A small modest planet in the universe. A pretty crowded planet, not much land here and the landscapes here are so narrow you could think of it as a snake from outer space. What makes Von Wack different from other planets is the huge, and I mean huge, plant life that it has. Every manner of plant life on this planet is so huge that it blots out the sun. If you ever thought of what life as an ant was like, then this is the planet to go to. Currently, planet Von Wack seems to be an empty, barren planet. But long ago, no one knew how long, there used to be intelligent inhabitants living on the more tropical areas of the planet. Humans, yes. Were they intelligent? No, they're pretty dumb actually. There were only two tribes, and they ended up scheming and killing each other until they all just died, which is how Von Wack ended up an empty, humanless planet. But before that happened, Von Wack had this huge tree the size of... It was huge, okay? It was really huge, humongous, genungus, among us, okay? It was huge, big tree. Think of the Ambrosial Arbor, but like 10 times bigger. That's a little hint on which Aeon might be on this planet. This gigantic tree was called the Thistang Tree and was situated on the most known island of Wack. Maybe the name Von Wack means that everything on that planet came from Wack Island? You know, Von Wack from Wack? Wack Island? Anyway, all the more because the people in Von Wack have a quasi-religious reverence of the tree. Why? Because the Thistang tree bears fruits. 
not your typical fruits either. The fruits were yellowish and oval shaped, and what comes out of these fruits are all kinds of animals and creatures living in Von Wack today. I won't make any deep crazy inferences or theories about Yaoshi, but come on, just look at this deer and that fruit. See? See? <laughs> but enough theory. Back to Von Wack lore, there was also an evil sort of fruit, designed to destroy as much as it can on the planet. The tribe's people called it the Demon King and would come together and unite to defeat it every 60 natural years, probably Von Wack years. This cycle would go on and on until outsiders entered the planet. Although they were treated quite badly, the tribe's people thought they were thieves. The outsiders were kind of the actual reason that Bonwak has no tribe's people and not for the reasons that you think. See, the outsiders wanted to know what was up with the tree and why it spawns the Demon King. After becoming friends with the tribes and sailing into Wack Island, the outsiders sneaked away and looked into the tree. And boy did they look into it. See, while the tribes people were preparing for battle, the outsiders sneaked away and started to dig into the tree, like literally cutting trees, cutting other branches, destroying whatever they could just so they could get closer to the tree and finding, well, the truth. And what they found was a control cabin that could control the Thies Tang tree. The truth behind the island was that it was an eco-genesis system from a higher civilization. An advanced society of intelligent life made this tree and put it here to create the numerous yellowish fruit animals of Von Wack. Not only that, it could detect what life form should be spawned into the planet, basically to balance the planet as a whole. A self-sufficient auto-correcting technological system that manages the life forms of the entirety of Von Wack. And the Demon King was just a simple data in the tree's code system. Moreover, this Demon King that spawned from the tree was an extinct interstellar worm. Whatever that means. The outsiders, wanting to help the tribes people, simply deleted the data of the Demon King and just left. No merit, no praise, just delete the Demon King and they headed out. Just like that. The tribes people, after finding out there's no Demon King, they were ecstatic. They were celebrating. They talked about what to do next now that there's no Demon King. Basically planned their future. But after that night, both tribes immediately started scheming to take over each other. And then a war began. And in those wars, no one was left. They all died because of the selfish war that they waged. Von Wack had no humans anymore, but still continued with the abundant life that the Thistang tree spawned. Planet Von Wack. Let's move on to Planet Silverwolf, namely Punk Lord. Now I've already made an in-depth video for both Punk Lord and Silverwolf's lore, so if you're curious to know about that specifically, then here's a link to that video. Simply put, Punk Lord is a planet of hackers. Think cyberpunk edge runners. Not the game. I mean, sure, we could talk about the game, but I don't wanna. Everything and everyone in Punk Lord revolves around a game-like mindset called Punk Lord Mentality. Life's a game and everything will be treated as such. And it works quite well for them. An exam is a game, a challenge is a game, a battle is a game, a mission is a game, and a life or death situation is also a game. And as games go, the only objective is to win and beat it. Simple, right? A better mindset than the cringe gamer quotes that we're used to seeing too, in my opinion. Right now, all we know is that Punk Lord has hackers based on Silverwolf. I mean, who knows what else is on Punk Lord? Body augmentations, substances, gun companies, maybe Skrulamite robots are there too. Every form of cyberpunk or steampunk technophile you could think of. If you've watched any cyberpunk show, there are a lot of nuances to what a person can do in that world. But back to hackers, these aren't just your run-of-the-mill hackers. Or at least people like Silverwolf. There exists a certain group of individuals, ones that don't get tired or fatigued. They're said to be attempting to touch upon the umbilical cord of truth. They believe that the vastness of the universe is just a line of code, and every form of existence is a data of that code. These hackers compile everything from entire planets into symbols and form code for everyone to understand. Their main aim is to understand that and decipher the code of the universe. 
Just like Von Wack's life forms are simple data codes, the universe is also a line of code. That's the sort of philosophy that punk lord hackers believe, and honestly it's a pretty realistic belief if you think about real life science and space and technology. That's how powerful the legendary punk lord hackers are, and it's what every hacker aims to achieve. These hackers can hack entire cities or shut down multiple networks and here's the kicker, change reality. Yeah. They do what's called Aether editing, which can literally edit any object and alter everything that's around them to suit their needs or preferences. We've already seen Aether editing from Silverwolf's combat abilities. Dropping Mario bricks, creating virtual high scores based on damage, even teleporting other assailants to different locations. The only thing Aether editing is limited to is destroying universes, specifically the simulated universe created by Herta. It is a limitation, but who's to say that someone can achieve such heights of power someday, right? And we haven't even talked about the inventor of Aether editing, Sage. Or the Sage? I don't know. Who made the once theoretical fantasy of Aether editing into reality. In Punk Lord, there are hackers who are so great that they become legends. And before Silverwolf, there were four other legendary hackers, namely Sage, Zero, Stoneblade, and Twin Snake. Sage created Aether Editing, who raided a place called the Dark Zone, which he then became a wraith in the interastral network. Maybe he integrated himself into the interastral network? I don't know. This speaks volumes to the extent that Aether Editing can achieve. Zero froze Punk Lord's entire network to get the attention of the IPC. Twin Stake and Stoneblade, who were rebellious and collaborative hackers, becoming members of the Galaxy Rangers. It's interesting too that every hacker, or at least a legendary hacker, has their own definition of Punk Lord mentality. And sometimes these legendary hackers leave behind their journeys imprinted in an Aether cartridge. We only know of one Aether cartridge and it's believed to be from Stoneblade, who left it as a love letter to Twin Snake. They're not just records of journeys either, no no. An Aether cartridge is Aether editing but cranked up to 100. Basically amplify the amount of Aether editing that you could do and tests the limit of how much of a hacker you actually are. This is where the extent of Aether editing is and Silverwolf has a copy of that or a copy of a copy. Whether or not it has the same use as the original, we can't say. But yeah, there you go. Punk Lord and Punk Lord mentality. Yari Low 6 Heavily inspired, or I think, by Slavic inspirations. The name Yarilo, as well as the city of Belabog, is inspired by Slavic gods and symbolisms. Now this might sound like a hot take, but I'm also bad at finding the origins of names. Sele is the only character with a German origin that I could find. And in an interview from Bronya, Sele says that her name was said to be an ancient Belabogian name. This info comes from Oleg, and we have no idea about the ancient Belabog before the actual backstory. Right? Maybe there's more backstory to the backstory, I, I don't know. But Yarilo was inspired from the god of rebirth, Yarilo, and Belabog inspired from the Slavic symbol of light and happiness, or the white god, by which its counterpart is the black god, Chernobog, which I think symbolizes death and destruction. And considering what happened with the Fragmentum and the Stellaron, you could say that they have some relation and inspiration to their backstory. But enough about inspirations, a quick summary of Yarilo's mythological backstory. A long time ago, there were once two factions in Yarilo. The eleven Perun states with their god of thunder, Perun, and the Veles Union army with their god of war, Veles. Until the Veles Union defeated the Perun state, these two factions were at constant war. After defeating the Perun state, the Veles Union thanked their god of war, Yarilo, who was the son of Perun, kidnapped by Veles. And so the name Yarilo was used for the planet. Obviously, there's more nuance to the story of the two gods and how everything actually happened. And if you're curious, a folklore book explains the story of four gods. Veles, Perun, Morana, 
and Yarilo, as well as the origin of the entire planet, leading to a mythological creation story or folk tale similar to creation stories from other worlds. Without having to explain the entire book, the folk tale was supposed to be a classic cycle of life, death, and rebirth. But because of the Stellaron, and by extension the Eternal Freeze, the entire folk tale was completely changed. And because the Eternal Freeze covered up the planet for such a long time, and all the people were so scattered and lore was scattered as well, the next generation of people, as well as the legends about Yarilo, were slowly changed to fit the current situation of the planet. Hence the somewhat messy and altered origin story of Yarilo 6, as well as the number 6. I don't even know how that number came to be. As for the history that we know of, Yarilo 6 has had interactions with many galactic factions in the past. Around 1000 years or so, Akavili once went to Yarilo to connect the planet with the rest of the universe. Which is why Yarilo is also part of our current trailblaze. Because of Akavili, other factions were able to visit the planet, such as the Architects, the IPC, and the Intelligentsia Guild. Mostly due to the Giromaro deposits in the planet for both trade and research. Except for the architects, who came to preach their Aeon Clipoth, hence the quick advancement and steampunk design of both the overworld and underworld of current day Bellabog. This was a bit short lived, however, because of Yarilo 6's limited resources and a certain mad lad, aka Nanook, started yeeting Stellarons everywhere, halting everything in the universe's progression, and leading the planet of Yarilo 6 to the eternal breeze. Thanks a lot, Nanook. A lot of people, both indigenous and foreign, left the planet and the only ones who stayed, or at least was recorded, was Alisa Rand, an architect who vowed to help save Yarilo by doing what architects of clipbots are good at, and that's building things. She began building all sorts of shelters, which she then later created the fortification, the final bastion against Fragmentum. Bellobog, and as it was created, refugees came to seek protection from the Fragmentum. This led to poets and poems, as well as stories that brought culture to Bellobog, as well as inviting more refugees to join them. This didn't come without any trials, however. While creation was underway and the fortification was being enacted, the Fragmentum monsters destroyed many of the shelters around the planet, which were built to defend against them. It's that bad at that time, okay? A long defense of Bellabog for 30 years occurred until it was actually completed, like fully completed. Sometime after, Alyssa Rand activates the Celeron out of desperation to save Bellabog against the Fragmentum. Hence the still living yet frozen Fragmentum monsters that you see in Bellabog or everywhere in Yarilo 6, which is a terrifying concept because Bellabog is the only city left standing. Recorded history states that the Eternal Freeze was created by the will of all Bellobogians. But of course, we know that the actual history is not what it seems. After Alyssa Rand's sacrifice, she was named the first Supreme Guardian, and the title, She Who Evokes Miracles. As time passed for about 500 years, the title of Supreme Guardian was passed down from family ties or through the choosing of an heir by the Supreme Guardian herself. If you're curious about the line of Supreme Guardians until current times, you can simply go over to the Billabog History and Culture Museum for a quick look at all the different Supreme Guardians. Now, the succession of Supreme Guardians continues on for about five generations, if I could remember, with Kokolia Ran being taken in from the underworld becoming the late Supreme Guardian of Bellabog, followed by Bronya, who was also from the Underworld and is now the current Supreme Guardian. The entire planet has other landforms apart from Bellabog, which you can find from this big terrestrial globe at Fort Clipoth. At the moment, the History and Culture Museum is the only accessible location, but Bellabog has a College of Arts, a theater, and other cultural and technological facilities, both in the Overworld and the Underworld. So, expect more areas within Bellabog to open up slowly as we get more permanent events and patch additions. And there you go, Yarilo 6, my favorite planet at the moment. Alright, every planet in Honkai Star Rail Explained Part 2. 
that's gonna be it for now. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope it's been informative and interesting to you as well. Comment below which planet you are most interested in and which one you would like to see next. Now then, I think part 3 is gonna be about the less known or obscure planets that may be related to other games as well, like Honkai Impact. But until then, that's all the planets I'll talk about. I won't take any more of your time because I'm pretty sure this video is already 20 minutes long. So like, comment if you enjoy, subscribe and hit the bell for more of my ramblings and stay mad theorists. Bye!